Mizmor le David, Adonai roi, lo echsar, binot desha yarbitzeni, al me menuchot yinahaleni. Nafshi yeshovev lemagle tzedek leman shmo, gam ki elech begets al mavet, lo irara ki ata imadi. Shiftecha umishantecha hema yenachamuni. Taroch lefanai shulchan neged sorerai. Dishanta veshemen roshi. Chosi rivaya. Achtov vechesed yodifuni. Kol yemei chayai. Beshaft i bevet Adonai, the Orif Gamim. A prayer song of David. Eternity abiding is my shepherd, my caring, watchful God. Nothing do I lack. In grassy fields it lays me down. Along calm waters, it leads me. My spirit, it restores. It guides me in ways that are right and just, for a purpose beyond my separate self, for the sake of its unpronounceable, nearly unpronounceable name. All this is so, even when I walk in valleys of darkest shadow, even in the darkest shadow of death, I fear no harm for you. I feel no harm, whatever harm will come. My will is part of the human condition, for you are with me. Your hard guidance and your ever-present support it is they, Hema, Yenachamuni, it is they that comfort, that are the source of comfort, accompany a sense that I am accompanied uh, and deepened. You set before me a sustaining table against those narrow straits, so rari, that threaten to bind and block me. You anoint and grace my head with fragrant oil. How my cup is full. Oh, ach, ach to chesed. Oh, whatever happens as part of our human condition, only let it be that engaging the good and the beauty of acts of caring generosity that are so moving and they're going beyond the conventional distance we keep from one another and they're reaching the heart of what really matters that's all my translation of my experience of my translation of my experience of chesed that's all my of one three letters chesed how many letters do I have there? Hmm. If you count up not only the words, letters. Only let it be that engaging the good and the beauty of acts of caring generosity that are so moving and they're going beyond the conventional distance we keep from one another and in their reaching the heart of what really matters, they that pursue me all the days of my life, whatever days that I will remain before me, will continue before me. May my life be about that, that chesed, that engaging the good and the beauty of acts of caring generosity that are so moving and they're going beyond the conventional distance we keep from one another. And they're reaching the heart of what really matters. May that pursue me all the days, whatever days I have left in my life that I may thereby dwell for whatever days remain in my life, that I may thereby dwell 
in the perspective of eternity abiding, my days thus being experienced as significant as well lived. Now, what is new, or relatively, and different in my translation? Well, of course there's this question of how to refer to the divine. Of course, in Hebrew there's either a feminine or masculine. There's no neuter. So you can't say table is not neuter. Table is uh, masculine, as it were. In other words, what I'm arguing is that when we translate into English, where you do have the neuter, table is not, should not be referred to as him or his, he, but as uh, it. Now, the divine, at times, the reality we call the divine, should be translated he or she, when there's a certain intimacy involved. But, a kadosh, for example, Baruch Hu, and we have Gersaot versions where it's hakodesh, which is even more so. More so what? More so abstract, impersonal, sacred. May it be blessed. Holy, may it be blessed. Seems to me. Ha'elohut, we say, yes? The divinity, the Godhead. Ha'elohut. So this again is very abstract, non-human. We personify the divine very often in our tradition, but we also know deep down that it is nothing like anything human. Even the Zohar, even the, the Ari, Yitzchak Luria's teachings, of the Sfirot. Deep down we know, Kabbalah knows, that really the divine is the Ein Sof, infant. The Zohar calls it Klal below Pras, generality without the specificity, without the breakdown of Chesed, Din, Tiferes, etc. That's uh, an act of seems so of contracting, of limiting the divine so that we can know something of it. But really the divine is in self. Really it can't be known. In the mystical tradition, practice, consciousness, experience. There are moments there is possibility of bitul hayesh, to cancel the self, our self-awareness that we exist as a separate being. And of course that happens not only in mystical <laughs> meditative prayer, whose goal is bitul hayesh, and it can be achieved through other means as well, of canceling, of destroying uh, Again, my ego awareness, my, and this doesn't just mean humility, much more than that. My awareness of myself in any sense whatsoever of my separate self. I can lose that completely. This for some period of time. Peter Berger talks about how this can happen even uh, playing a game. Basketball, I don't think he mentions basketball as an example, but... When I'm in the game, it's the second movement, it's the music, or it's the second inning, it's baseball. And when engaged in that way, or engaged in a page of Talmud, whose difficulty, like often in our course of study, 
I put out this and I put out that. Megalema'at or mechasema'at. I reveal a little bit of what my intention is by putting out all of these things. Megalema'at or mechasema'at. But then I conceal, cover it up. Especially as in the first part of the course. And then a little bit more, a little bit more. I reveal more and more. Why? Because in the beginning, as much as possible, I have to lead a peck to restrain myself, to undergo symptom, contraction, holding back, so as to make room for you. So that you, through the confusion, have to figure it out. And the it isn't the same for everybody. It's also not totally different for each person. So it shouldn't be anyway. So there is this divinity which is, uh, even in Kabbalah, which is nothing like a human being. Abstract, universal, infinite. And yet that we can know something or catch a glimpse of in prayer and study, nature, love, friendship, etc. So I've translated it, the divine. The biggest difference, what's new in, in this translation, is this notion that, oh, whatever happens as part of our human condition. In other words, the conventional understanding of this psalm is, I fear no harm, for you are with me, means harm won't come to me. God will protect me. Notice those kinds of sentences, really, that personify. We have to be careful, again, of personification in Judaism when it comes to the divine. So, again, God will protect me. It sounds like a human being. But, however it's understood or experienced, the conventional understanding of those words of Psalm 23, Lo irara ki ata imadi, is, uh, you'll protect me from harm. I won't be harmed. I won't be machine gunned down by the Nazis. Or put in a gas chamber just minutes after getting off the so called train. Cattle cars, box cars. Harm won't come to me. Because you're with me. This is the conventional reading, but in my translation, I'm saying, I fear no harm, for you are with me. In other words, harm will come. It's part of the human condition. There's free will or relative free will of human beings. They can take up that free will and choose to be cruel to other human beings. which is being cruel to themselves as well, ultimately. Also, we live in a physical world. We live uh, in bodies. We think that's good in Judaism. <laughs> I was referring to that uh, in the video uh, in relation to Tzviatamaitya, the rising of resurrection of the dead in the messianic end time. I was beginning to develop. I actually didn't uh, excuse me, continue uh, that right through. I was beginning to argue that it, this does not have to be understood literally, the resurrection of the dead in the messianic time. But rather for the rabbis it was very important in the light of uh, in, in lies and the, and the <laughs> Uh, the fog or you know, the, uh, uh, of uh, some new uh, approaches uh, to our lives uh, 
that was developing, uh, that was on the scene during the rabbinic period, the Mishnaic period, and uh, the period of the development of the Gemara, the Talmud, and uh, Babel, the Babylonian area. Uh, yes, that um, such that uh, uh, I fear uh, such that there was an argument that the spirit takes precedence over the letter, the letter of the law. It's the spirit of, behind the law, within the law, but you don't really need the law all the time. The law is something very uh, concrete, very earthly, very this-worldly. So it also has to do with the, we call it the corpus, the corpus of literature, of sacred literature, sacred texts. When it comes to halakha, the law, it's read rather literally, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Not exactly literally very often, but uh, certainly taken seriously in a sense that involves uh, practicing it in some way. It may depart from what the verses themselves would seem to suggest is uh, how they are to be implemented in everyday practice, uh, deed. But certainly in some way, or ways, uh, they are to be those passages in our sacred uh, texts that refer to uh, law, that involve law. Uh, yes, we understand them in Judaism too, in rabbinic Judaism to involve actual deeds. So in that sense, it's literal. The corpus, the body of the literature, also the, our own bodies, uh, is no less important than spirit kind of is a problem if you only have spirit and not bodies. <laughs> you can yes. A spirit needs body, you know. Loha meitim ya hallelujah. It's not a good state to be in, <laughs> bodiless. Uh, you see, so uh, the, and, and this indeed was a, uh, as Christianity developed as a separate uh, religious uh, tradition, practice, and understanding. Uh, many of its teachers uh, turned against uh, the source, uh, the beginnings of this new Christianity, namely Judaism, with vehemence. Uh, and so, uh, again, uh, I fear no harm, uh, but you are with me. Uh, it's not a good thing to be harmed, mm -hmm. but harm is uh, part of the human situation. If we uh, have relative free will, as I said, if we live in bodies in a physical world, stuff happens, earthquakes, accidents can happen with human beings from such uh, events. And of course, we walk around with a body, so there can be uh, infections, diseases. Uh, we're mortal; all of us are going to die at some point from something. Uh, so, what's new here is I fear no harm for you are with me. In the, in the context of this translation of the whole psalm, as I've translated it, doesn't mean harm will not come to me. Harm will come to me. Again, it's part of the human experience. But I won't fear it. It will happen at times, but I won't fear it. Because I will not feel forsaken. I will not feel that I'm alone. I will feel accompanied by the presence, or at least a glimpse, a trace, an intimation of the reality we call the divine. That accompanies me. And I explicitly say that with, uh, oh, whatever happens is part of our human condition. May my life pursue uh, be all about chesed as long as I have life. 
Now, actually, here I'm very much drawing upon an interpretation in Midrash Tehilim. In Midrash Tehilim, for Psalm 23, the Hebrew word ach, which I translated here o, uh, and only, I mean really, only let it be, ach, uh, both the o and the only, is translating only let it be that engaging the good and the beauty of acts of care and generosity pursue me be about what my life is about. Midrash T. Lim says for the word ach, this is an unusual kind of a term, uh, that it should mean only if. But Midrash T. Lim understands it as a kind of a O, oh, actually as a kind of a ve, I, <laughs> as an exclamation of uh, out of distress, of distress. And it says, if sharply you surim. Yes, this is what the Midrash says on the word ach. If shar below, below surim, is it possible? without uh, suffering at all? Is a human life possible? Is, is, it, is the first part of the psalm in, in grassy fields it lays me down along calm waters it leads me? I mean is that all? Life? Can life be that without sufferings, without difficulties? In other words it's a rhetorical question. Midrash Shimon is saying no it's not possible. In fact, along calm waters doesn't have to mean calm waters. It can mean when small, medium, and large bad things, so-called things, stuff, when bad is happening to me, could be the most horrific bad, suffering. So all around me is not calm, but within me. I can be calm, or I can face it with calmness, because I know myself to be accompanied by something anyway of eternity, infinity, immortality, yeah, not immortality of my own ego or my own self, Steve, in some disembodied way or whatever, no. So this is something of uh, my translation about my translation concerning my translation center. I, d I just want to go back again to this theme, this question of uh, at the time, the resurrection of the dead at the time of the messianic end. So as I was beginning to say, uh, that this doesn't have to be taken literally, but the, the, the rabbis were of great concern, very concerned that with some of these new ideas, the religious experiences going around, which preference, highly preference, uh, spirit, the spiritual, uh, to the negation at the great expense of the uh, body of this world. Uh, the body was just as important for the spirit, as I said. Without, a, as I was saying, without a, without a body, you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> it's hard to develop anything of the spirit if you know you don't have any body, embodiment in this world. So, Friedrich Nietzsche says in his book, *The Birth of Tragedy*. The original title was *The Birth of Tragedy and the Spirit of Music*. Friedrich Nietzsche said, uh, argued that. Uh, our notions of the next life, of some afterlife, uh, actually reflect our ideals, how we understand what's really important, what really matters in, in this life. That was one of my phrases also in my translation, yes? Reaching the heart of what really matters, what really matters. It's not so easy to figure out what really matters. We've encountered that in our studies so far from the German playwright Bertolt Brecht, 
in his little piece, Five Difficulties in Telling the Truth. And uh, yes, it was part of that, what was it, 18 page uh, packet about is, is this true? Or what, how can this be true? And he says the biggest question in terms of what is, uh, in terms of uh, telling the truth, writing the truth, teaching the truth as best we can, as close as we can get to the truth. The biggest problem, he says, is figuring out what truth is worth uh, telling, is worth writing, is worth making a movie of, is worth teaching, sharing. What what truth, what truths, uh, what really matters that ought to drive our writing, teaching, sharing with one another? Excuse me, that's a very big question. To me, it's the biggest question that is too often, most often, missing, not really engaged in Jewish education. As I said, in any education, people teaching Shakespeare, same thing. What's really at stake here? So uh, the rabbis, as I've said, Nietzsche says that, that our ideas of the afterlife Uh, we posit some kind of afterlife for a number of reasons. But whatever the different reasons, uh, which are reasons that may not uh, indeed uh, be true, <laughs> reflect depth and responsibility and honesty about our human situation, but rather wishful thinking of our fears and needs for security and uh, answers, even when there's, the answer is different than we want it to be, or there is no answer, uh, even when we want there to be one. So for the rabbis, the, it was very so. So again, the Nietzsche and others argued this that a notion, notions of the afterlife, have to do with ideals relative to this life, as well as he says that we're not too thrilled with how things are in this life. If we were, uh, we wouldn't be dwelling so much, if at all, on some afterlife. I mean, Genesis teaches us that the, God, the, the world is good. Its potential is good. The laws of how everything works is good. It would be terrible if it was some Star Trek planet, and for instance, there wasn't at least relative, what I call relative free will, etc. There really weren't in bodies, etc. But some bad stuff comes from that, too. I mean, but it's inextricable from, from the good that comes of it. So that uh, when it comes to the afterlife, this emphasis on the spirit, more than emphasis, preference for the spirit over the body, over the letter, over the law, over the here and now, over this world, at the expense of all the above. The rabbis wanted to uh, really defend the body and put it right up there with the spirit. And so it said, okay, resurrection of the dead in, in the ideal end time, in the next world, quote unquote, so-called, uh, the bodies will, will rise, not just the spirits. It's gonna be even more crowded than the roads are and the airports and everything. <laughs> Uh, before Thanksgiving, or here in Israel, before Pesach, or whatever. Yeah. So what am I doing here? Why well, share with you uh, my translation of the Psalm? So you should uh, Psalm 23. So you should agree with me. Well, as I've said already uh, in one of our earlier videos today. Uh, that wouldn't be very good. First of all, we already have me and my views in the world. 
so we don't need uh, no. uh, but also I mean understanding involves some violence uh, to what we are encountering some distortion some addition I'm adding myself to it or else uh, so if I'm modeling something here I'm modeling getting down to specifics the specifics a specific take on the meaning meanings significances what's involved with this or that instance of religious language or image in our sacred texts this one or that one what is really involved what is really at stake what is going on here as I say we too often are not uh, really exploring to such an extent the words, the key ideas, images, names for the various realities that our tradition sees an in depth human life as engaging. So don't follow uh, at least not completely <laughs> maybe in part there's some ideas some approaches some perspectives that I share with you that you can adapt to your your own quest I mean, you don't want to come out of this course or any course of study or any encounter with anything other than oneself we don't want to come out exactly the same as we were before so we open ourselves to something that might be a bit new and different. Yes, Mark and others, uh, uh, my other colleagues, uh, my other fellow, uh, all of all of you, my fellow explorers of uh, an experiential Jewish classroom education. Uh, yes. Part of what it's all about to encounter something other than myself is to is to locate to identify elements that are similar between that which I encounter and myself as I have known myself heretofore. But let's not lose sight of the and sense and hearing and all of our senses feeling and thinking and acting upon that feeling and thinking. Uh, let's not miss that at least half of what encountering what is not I is all about is that I should open myself to the possibilities of uh, something different from where and what and why I am as I am heretofore. But I'll speak more about this in terms of our in relation to our last piece of thinking writing for the course for our course in relative to our, in relation to our course of study. Namely that I, I want you to that all of us should keep in mind this theme of me and uh, me not meaning me alone yes but each of us uh, and uh, some kind of experiential Jewish classroom before these months of engaging in this course of study and now what can you identify as some possible change some possible difference in your perspective about Judaism, about Jewish education. About life. A human life, human lives, according to 
Judaism according to Jewish education. I want to share with you a couple more of our texts for this week in uh, some further videos that maybe I'll have the strength to uh, already uh, uh, record this evening, if not then uh, tomorrow. Thank you again so much. So we, again, we continue this. Yes.